I have something fun to share today. The basic idea is that magnetic pressure or density is something that exists. Now let me tell you how I figured this out and what's going on here. So, I know this is just my workbench here. Uh, a while ago, somebody, a guy named Harold, came up with this idea that you put magnets in this arrangement on a spinny disc and you hold, well, you have an item hold it for you, uh, another set of magnets pointed at 90 degrees to them. And it ends up making a sideways thrust, which is interesting, seemingly reactionless thrust. So I like this idea, but a plastic disc with heavy weights kind of scares me. Um, anyway, Harold did it, put it up on his YouTube channel. Jeremiah Pop, he built one, seemed to work. Pours off a lot of air when you're running this, or at least it feels like airflow. And um, so he put his inside a plastic container. Was it cardboard? Anyway, no more airflow, still worked. So that's interesting, reactionless thrust. But still, I don't like spinny things. So I took an iron cube, it looks like this one, two inch iron cube, and I wrapped it on three directions with magnetic coils. So when I ran direct current through um, the one, so you'd get a magnetic field pointing straight up here, and then 90 degree delay time between the two other coils, the same frequency, so that makes a rotating magnetic field with a directional component up. It didn't do anything as far as what I could see. So I unplugged the vertical coil and I stuck a pile of magnets on one side. Now this makes an imbalance. This also moved. So then I went and tried a different version where I took a steel ball, two inch diameter steel ball. This is an extra. The original is in this little container here. And I put a magnetic coil, just a plain simple coil, on each side of it. I've got a little spacer in here so the coils don't hit each other. And I ran that with a couple of different field formats. My last video covers uh, that. And I hooked it up and uh, it moved as well. So I'm like, okay, fine. It's got to be experimental error, right? So I took this and I set it on the table sideways and then I hung a coffee mug from the ceiling and it moved the coffee mug back and forth when I drove this. Um, if you want the field formats and all that, see my last video. I'm like, okay, fine. I couldn't get anyone else to reproduce it because, you know, that's obviously a pain. So I'm like, why don't I reproduce it on my own? Because that's the first thing you should do. So... I got a piece of rebar, it's one foot long, six layers of little coils on there. Um, it's exactly the same length as a AA battery because that's what I wound the, the little paper form on. Anyway, uh, it also moved back and forth. I got that to move. Now it's a really small force, but it did move. So I started thinking about what in the world's going on here and thinking about Michael Faraday's original experiments. He figured out the relationship between electricity and magnetism. They were 27 equations in quaternion, which people, a lot of people don't even know what that math is. Now, Mr. Heaviside, a while later, he condensed those into four equations, and he made a, an assumption, and he even talked about how he did it incorrectly. And what he did is get rid of the magnetic pressure or density or whatever you want to call it because as we know it magnets have a field strength and they have a, um, a vector and that's how we've been dealing with magnets for a long time because that's what heavy side told us they did when the original math the original experiments showed they had three components they had a magnitude a vector and a pressure and we've been engineering our whole civilization without the pressure component and turns out the pressure component actually can move things around. This is a big deal. So um, that, that's the big thing. Now, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that um, I should mention is that engineering uh, this magnetic compressor, pressure component. Now, it's gone by a bunch of different names over the years. 
because uh, everybody that figures it out calls it something else. Uh, some people call it the ether. Wilbert Smith called it a tempic field or time field. Um, people that have discovered it in wave format only will call it a longitudinal wave. People that have used the, like the little bagel coils, they uh, see it as a toroidal moment. Uh, other people will call it warped space. And warped space, of course, sounds all fancy and cool, but it doesn't really get you anything useful because there's no way to engineer it. But if you tell somebody this is a magnetic pressure, then all of a sudden, with some copper wire and an amplifier and a signal generator, you can make something that will get you a noticeable effect, um, which is pretty neat. Um, other people already know this sort of field is out there. They just don't know what it's called. Uh, I mean, what's causing it. It's called the um, near-field effect for radio waves. You've got uh, like a little switching transformer, like for a cell phone, like I'm recording this on. Uh, you get radio interference, and you can't shield against it. That's because it's a magnetic pressure wave. Fairly high frequency, goes through, messes up all kinds of things. Uh, a Verizon tech um, with a service monitor demonstrated why they're losing the fourth generation phone network. And it's because there's so much interference from these things and it can't be shielded against. These little crummy phone chargers are causing most of the issues. Anyway, so it's not like this evidence isn't all over the place. And the evidence that I'm amazed with is I have four devices that will let me do this at this point. Um, and the coffee cup moving, that one really got me because that's not experimental error with it getting attracted to the Earth's magnetic pole or something. That's something fundamentally different. Um, now the health effects of this thing. Uh, this magnetic pressure wave I do believe is used by biology and I was putting a square wave into this thing and my goodness it messed me up. It took me the third time to realize it was coughing, sneezing, allergies, started feeling really sick every time I turned this thing on. Uh, I'm not going to turn it on again. There is just no reason for me to do that. Besides, somebody else needs to verify it, make sure it works if we're going to do that. It, me running it again is pointless. I can post the video of me doing so if, uh, if I get a chance. Now, the one that I ran the sine waves into, that didn't have as bad effects. And I think it's because there were no sharp edges on that wave to go mess with the biology. But um, there are certainly formats that are going to do a way better, better deal with it health-wise. Uh, like, for example, if we take uh, a big magnetic coil, this one's 20 inches across, I think inside diameter is 18 inches, and um, we use that to make a big vertical magnetic field. That way, if we, I know this is example coil, way too small, the whole thing's too small, and make these iron segments spin around, or the uh, magnetic equivalent of that would probably be more useful and faster. But let's say we did something like this, totally mechanical, and it's spinning around, it will take electrons on the outside and it will start orbiting them into a path. And that will make basically the same sort of magnetic pressure thing, only it's not AC, it's just a pressure drop in a giant bubble. Uh, same thing like what this does, just makes a giant bubble pressure drop, and once you misalign it with the magnets on one side, or I mean this is capturing the, the field, uh, just like a spinning fan or something, but this imbalances it enough to where you can actually see it move some. So as this moves around and spins, this will trap your charges to where you'll actually get enough energy in the field because you're not going to lose your energy. It's all recirculated because the magnetic field has the ions trapped so that they uh, they can only go uh, with the, uh, the magnetic field lines. They can't just go straight to the center or leave. So anyway, uh, that's kind of a clever idea to recirculate it. Uh, but if you take something like this, uh, uh, a disc, and you put this one inside that coil. It does fit. It's just not assembled at the moment. Oops. Um, then you could take the output of that homopolar generator that's powered by the magnetic coil 
and you can get an extreme... I mean, this coil would be too high impedance for it, and the disc would be too small, but um, that would get you... There's a neat little document I found that uh, does the math on this, and they show that a homopolar generator that's powering its own magnetic field can theoretically come up with an infinitely strong magnetic field with a finite amount of current. I think that's really quite neat. So let's say you took your disc and you cast some metal segments into it. You could align the whole thing. I guess they could be separate as well, uh, to where when that disc spun, it would make the magnetic field to trap everything, and it would... Um, spin that field so you're still going to get your magnetic pressure drop in the middle of this thing and all you'd have to do is set another coil either you know wherever it happens to be to imbalance that enough to where it's a low pressure zone with uh, an imbalance to be able to create thrust one direction and that one is not going to have a frequency component to it so much because it's just going to be a static bubble i think that'll mess with the biology a lot less um I know there's various resonance systems that work that'll make magnetic pressure drops, um, but still, they've got a frequency to them. I'm not sure how well they're going to do with biology. There's other things that are going to be interesting, like the caduceus coil. This is focused well. Um, and this will make a magnetic pressure wave that will leave. You can hook this up to a radio transmitter, and that wave leaves and keeps going like a little beam out however far it's going to go. So there's all kinds of technology that uses this magnetic pressure, and I think the only trick was realizing it's magnetic pressure. I mean, people do uh, bifiler, cone coils, and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Here's uh, a coil form that's got four different traces through it. Uh, there's lots of different formats to be able to do this. Uh, this little thing is designed to wind a star coil. I don't have a coil lying around to show you. Uh, but that kind of format, you're making magnetic pressure and then you're uh, doing things with it. Back EMF, you get that sharp rise time and in the field, or I guess it's sharp fall time, and that will end up making the magnetic pressure uh, increase or lower and people have been pulling energy off of that. I think if you're making energy, you could put it at a distance, you'd probably be fine. Um, but that difference in the flow rate of time or the warping of space or whatever, if you have a copper wire between one of those areas and normal area, you will get current flow. And I know this because of this device that it's, I know it's buried under here, so it's a little hard to see. It's uh, got two discs, 50 of these little seg uh, steel segments on it, and the other one's on the other side. And... I watched 10 or 15 amps, somewhere in that range, after I shut the power off to it, but the disc still had inertia, where it was pouring current through a wire from one location to the other, inside the field and outside. Um, I think one of the reasons why this thing works so well is it's got counter-rotating discs. Because remember, you take something like this and you just start spinning it. You have to treat this magnetism. It's got these three components, the, uh, the direction or the vector, the magnitude of that vector, and then you've got the pressure. This is basically how you would describe a plasma is going to act a lot like this, or a, a viscous superfluid. So if you just start spinning this, it's going to start spinning all of the stuff around it in the room, and the pressure will just go back into the middle. So you're not really going to see a pressure drop or not much of one, because you've only got one reference point as to where if you counter-rotate, you're going to start getting um, a, a serious pressure drop. And I'm looking at... I don't know how to edit video. I'm sorry, folks. So I'm just looking at um, my notes here, trying to make sure I remembered everything. Um, oh, the other thing. When you start dropping the magnetic pressure, you're going to get... Um, the frequency of the matter, what it runs at. Basically, the idea would be the bagel coil field. I mean, you activate, the, and I dropped this on the floor, so it's kind of wonky now. I don't know if it works anymore. They have to be made pretty precision. Anyway, um, so if that same field is really what the quarks are made out of and those subatomic, sub-subatomic particles, then um, when you start changing 
the magnetic permeability, because you've just dropped the pressure inside your machine, you're going to change the frequency it operates at. And you're not going to probably be able to see it anymore. For all intents and purposes, it will start shifting color. It could potentially vanish on you. Lots of experiments, people have had things vanish on them and then come back as they lose energy with time. So remember that's a thing. You do not want to be at the boundary of these things. And by the way, this machine here, or that idea, where you've got this spinning, you could be inside it because all the fields that are going to be really obnoxious will be on the outside. You do not want to be at the boundary point of one of these machines or on the outside of it. Look at all the UFO reports where people see them and they're up close to these things and it makes them sick as heck. You do not want to be in one of those locations. Uh, just like you could create this with a rotating acoustic field and a solid magnetic field and fill up the whole area with ions so you get gobs of this happening at a small scale all over a whole area or volume. But I wouldn't want to be in there. That would just tear stuff apart. I mean, for all we know, that's how they me half melted the uh, the stones and fit them together so perfect and things like the pyramid and all those other ancient monuments. Uh, maybe that's how they did it. I don't know, but at least it was a passing thought. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned this magnetic pressure, the whole way you deal with this, treat it like a plasma, like a cold plasma, a viscous superfluid. And the engineering is going to start to come together. That's what's going to make it make sense. Um, oh, also remember, things like aluminum, which is why I don't think I'd use that aluminum plate. If I built this, I'd want it out of copper. Aluminum has an oxide layer on it that insulates. So it's going to do really weird things. And when I had this machine over here running, aluminum in the field did really odd stuff. It did not feel right. So careful about your materials. The other thing is there's a really neat experiment where somebody takes, I think it was cesium, something you can stick a magnet on, it doesn't stick. But um, what they basically showed was that um, they acted, the cesium atoms acted like uh, little magnets, only they were spinning when they started. You'd put them in another magnetic field so they'd try to line up, but they would just keep spinning because they had no friction. So they would just keep permanently spinning. So they never would settle down enough to attract a magnet, but you can do an experiment to show they are magnetic. So even materials that you think might not be magnetic, they might be. It just might be really hard to tell because of how they act. Um, oh, oh, uh, why the f time fields or magnetic pressure can be sticky, like why they can last for years, is something like the bagel coil. This makes... Uh, an electric and magnetic field that collapse in on themselves and they make a nice stable little component. But the pressure inside here, the magnetic pressure, can be different from the outside world. So you get a region of space that's got a different magnetic pressure, but it's self-contained. So that's something that absolutely happens and it doesn't have to be this format. There's lots of other formats it can be. Uh, like think about the Celtic knot work. Take one of these little coils and uh, just start tying knots with it. It doesn't have to be normal shapes. It could be something like um, DNA. The DNA pattern appears to be one of these stable electromagnetic fields. And uh, when I heard uh, Salvador Pius, I think that's his name, uh, talking about 3D printing in the, <laughs> in, um, in the vacuum space or whatever he called it, the ether, like how you would be doing that, I think that's exactly what DNA is. And when you put it around you know, the right amino acids, the amino acids zap into the right spot where the field is, and it is something physical then, which might make sense why these fields from the, these type of devices are so detrimental to human health. And even this one that I put the sine waves in, that's better, but when I first started running it, I ran it with a, a servo motor controller, which did pulse width modulation. I was sick for a week after running that. So be real careful with these experiments. Engineer it out, and remember the number one lesson here, warped space, the ether field, the time field, whatever you want to call this stuff, this is all magnetic pressure if you want to teach this stuff to an engineer and have them come up with something useful. View it as magnetic pressure, and it all starts making sense. At least it did to me. Anyway, good luck. Goodbye.